What does preparation look like being in the weight room side and on the, um, on the skill coach side as an assistant, like game day, walk me through a full day of like your life wearing two hats with like a tremendous amount of responsibility and a tremendous amount of pressure. How does the process of you athlete facing evolve throughout the day? Like, what is that experience like for the athlete? What is it like for you? Well, first off, I have a tremendous staff that it helps me out so that I could try to do this to the best of my ability. Um, I have my he works as an assistant for me, but he's really the, the women's head basketball string coach, Zach Zillner. Awesome dude. One of the most awesome personalities you'll ever meet, too. Um, so he assists me a ton in the weight room. We also have three interns that are in and out, and then we have two sports scientists that are in and out. So in my weight room alone, just on the performance side, at any given time, I have five to six people in the weight room with me at any given time. That is more resources than I technically had in the NBA. So that allows me to operate and flow in and out and to be on the court, in the weight room, and being able to be in both doors. Then on the basketball side, our director of player development, KJ Conklin, awesome dude, really high-level thinker, especially when it comes to um, most of our uh, motor learning strategies and how we're implementing our motion capture stuff. He's, he's incredible. And so if I don't have those entities, I wouldn't be able to flow. So now as far as the athlete FaceTime, I mean, it's pretty simple. We go into film. That's when we're all together. Then we get onto the court, we go into our quote unquote movement preparation for the day. That starts with me, and that's when we're doing a lot of uh, our warm up strategies, but with a basketball. Now, we utilize different types of basketballs. Um, we have the, the weighted basketballs. I use those primarily. There, there's multiple reasons why. The, the thought process I had was you know, like shot putters, they have different size, different weights, different. And when you have anything just slightly different, then it changes how you organize and how you move. And so that's where, to me, I was like, okay, different types of, of basketballs actually make a lot of sense because they still have to – if you have a slightly heavier ball, your orientation is going to be different. So if you just get exposures of that, it's kind of the same but different, right? Every rep's different. So it allows you to express yourself in different ways. So we do most of our basketball prep warm-ups with me, and we go through a ton of – in play stuff where it's we start off with isometrics, then we go into more stationary dynamic, then we go into locomotion, then we go into some pretty dynamic and some pretty wild looking stuff. I mean, we're taking the basketball, punching it in multiple directions while sprinting straight in ahead, uh, taking our eyes off target, running, hoping that we're anticipating where we are in space. We do a lot of things that are neck up and neck down, and then we just keep it uh, keep it consistently different. We just want to expose them to different things all year round because it's going to allow them to you know, just have their tissues hit different things at different speeds and hopefully develop a robustness other than just doing the same thing over and over. Then they go into the technical aspect, and this is where we're transitioning to KJ, who's taking our guys to their individuals. Then the tactical side. I don't touch the tactical side with a 10-foot pole. Like, no, when it comes to ball screen coverages and calling out, I, no. I'm just – if it has something to do with the human body – which means skill and physical, sure. But when it comes to tactical, nah, I'm out. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you guys handle that. Uh, then we go through our practice. Then we go into our weight room sessions. Um, on a typical game day, we'll have our uh, low-minute guys hoop in the morning. So we'll go weights, hoop, and then pregame, our high-minute guys go through their preparation, most of their motor learning, high speed, high velocity, high variability. So we're continuously getting better as an athlete as the season goes. Then we go into our warm-ups, game, and then post-game our high-minute guys are hitting their traditional lift. Yeah. Has that been a tough sell? Like the idea that I would assume up until this point, they're not used to training on game days. How has that been? It, and obviously – you know, just instantiating that into the culture. What is the, you know, do you have any, um, do you have any a highlight reel of the first time that a kid walked off the court? You're like, all right, in the weight room. And I say, what? Like, what is that? Right. What has that process been like in onboarding that as a new way of training for a lot of these guys? Yeah. When it starts, I never surprise anybody. So like I make sure that it's like weeks in advance before our first game for, I was like, Hey, just so you know, this is what we could do. And I give them two options. 
Option A, hey, you're going to come in in the morning. We'll knock out our lift in the morning. No problem. You have to get up earlier. You might have a shorter breakfast. Might not be as fun, but hey, we'll knock out our lift in the morning. She so had plenty of time to recover for the game. Or, or you can do your regular routine. I'll just see you right after. It's only 10 to 15 minutes. Your choice. Oh, man, that option B sounds really good. Cool. Option B it is. It's always been option B, but thank you for, <laughs> for, for making it option B. And so that's how I, I generally go through this because the reality is if we're trying to prepare these athletes for the next level, that is the demands of professional basketball. You play three and a half times a week. Your higher, quote, unquote, stressors from a weightlifting standpoint are going to have to be done around those game days, can't be between, or else you're just never really going to recover. Downward spiral, we all know what that looks like. And the cool part is coming from the Suns and the success we had and you know the viral videos of us training post-game, it's like it wasn't a hard sell at all. It was like, no, nah, that's, what, that's what the NBA guys do. It's like, yeah, yeah, I mean, it is now. But <laughs> there might have been a time where they were doing it, but not as consistent as us. And now it's, now it's, a, it's heavily – um, mediated now. I mean, you see that the Timberwolves were doing a big post game lift after they uh, swept the Suns, and it's now becoming like a part of the norm as far as lifting post games in the NBA. So, the college guys, if that's the goal, hey man, you might as well get used to this now. Do you see that being the way it goes? Do you see that trends that trickle down from pro into NCAA? Is there anything that is there any are there anything that uh, NCAA teams that are are doing that is groundbreaking and and you know building up into the into the league, or it is is the league really the point of validation for a lot of best practices in strength and conditioning? I think it's a trickle down effect, but the reality is, is a practice based model versus a game based model, right? Like there's things that in the NBA I could never get to. Now, don't get me wrong, that the thing that I'm most proud of is I never adopted the NBA norms. I did it my way, and I was very proud of that. Like, I spent four years in the league. I was going to do it my way. If it sucked, it sucked. If it was great, it was great, but I was not going to like, just bow down to this, oh, okay, like, you know, you only – you got to get 15 lifts in in a month or something like that. It was something crazy. Like, that was the tradition. I've seen NBA facilities where they actually had a checkboard where you just check your name to say that you lifted and you had to get 15 of them or 14 of them in a month or else you get fined. And literally I've heard stories where guys will come in, just hit some curls, check their name off the list, and that was part of it. And I'm like, nah, we're not. Like, we're not going to do that. Like, and luckily it all it all worked out extremely well. But um, that, now vice versa, what's really cool about college basketball, it's you got younger athletes, you're more robust, you're more plastic. So you're able to really challenge – some, how should I say this? You're in, you're able to introduce things and it, it gets adopted immediately. You don't have to like work on this whole like spiel and spend years developing something. No, nah, we're doing it tomorrow. Yeah, you know what? I think that's a good idea. We're doing it tomorrow. We're all gonna like it. Let's have fun. So that's what's really cool about college, and that's where I promise, like this human thing, you're gonna see a lot more people like plant, like tag, like uh, what else? Um, spike ball. You're gonna see a lot more of that stuff come up more reactive like games or, or in game games within games you're going to see that come up from college to the professional level because you're gamifying training and the way to get guys to buy in more and like actually have intent with what they do is gamify it in some form or fashion and it's just hard to do that at that level 